hold that against me. <laughs> um, so I was uh, searching for something to talk about that could be useful in 15 minutes, and I decided that uh, one thing that a lot of people have to struggle with is dealing with the browser history when they're building interactive applications. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, this is, I'm going to talk about how jQuery can help with that, but mostly I'm going to be talking about the problem in general and, and what happens under the hood to solve it. And then I'll give you some examples of jQuery libraries that encapsulate a lot of this for you so you don't have to do it yourself. So, um, I didn't realize I had builds on this one. Okay, so um, on interactive pages on the web, uh, you'll have uh, different content on the page displayed at different times. And um, this can happen uh, for a few reasons. You could have concealed areas on your page that are displayed from an accordion or tab technique. Um, you could have content that's not actually on the page at all that you load later with Ajax. Um, or you could have content that actually comes from the user uh, due to something they type into a field or in, in some way they create something that you didn't even anticipate ahead of time. <coughs> so the few, those are a few reasons that you might um, have different content on the page than you initially put there. So this leads to some problems with history of web browsers. Um, the first and foremost is when the user presses the back button all of the, the interaction they did is lost. Sometimes this is okay. If you've got a page with a simple accordion on it and the user clicks back, and then they come back to the page, they're not thrown off too much that they have to click to expose that piece of the accordion again. But for some of them, like the user-generated content, this is really potentially very crushing that the user lost all of their work just by pressing the back button. This, so this whole thing makes the, uh, the state that the, uh, that the web app maintains feel really flimsy to the user. It gives it an overall bad impression of your application. And in addition, this makes some dynamic pages, like the example of, of Ajax loading in content, actually be less useful than the static equivalent of just following links because it loses one of the main tools that users have been trained to use. So in HTML5, there is an API to deal with some of these issues. Um, and it's called the History API. And it, what it gives you is a stack, basically, of information about the page. Now, there's already a stack in the browser history. You're pushing a page onto the stack, popping it off with the back button. Um, but what this allows you to do is add things to that stack that aren't really pages. So this is how it looks. Um, the window object in HTML5 browsers has a history object, and you can call push state with some data that you provide, and with what you want the window title to become and with what you want the URL to be. Uh, this is limited that it has to be on the same domain for security purposes. Then there is a, an event called pop state that you can register that gets triggered every time something happens to the state, every time the user presses the back button or the forward button. And inside that, you can look inside the event object and find out the URL that you're now on you can also find out what the values that were passed into push state were at the time. And you can use that to um, restore the state of the, of the web app at some earlier time. So when the user takes an action, we call push state to record that action. And every time a pop state event occurs, we use the event state information to undo actions, redo actions, etc. So that's how you theoretically could use this API. Okay, so for an example, um, let's see here. Make this full screen. Um, this is uh, at HTML5 demos. I found this that 
shows that there are links here that when they're clicked on actually change the URL at the top um, and that we can use the back button to go back through these and we're actually not leaving this page. So that's how this works. Now, there are some drawbacks to this. First and foremost, of course, is that it's HTML5 and you want, you don't want this to work in other browsers. But there's more than just that. Um, a naive approach to implementing this means that the code you have to, to modify your document actually happens in two different places. You have it in the code where the user clicks the button that does something to the page, but then you have to do it again when you're popping the state and you have to figure out what to do again to the browser. And also, it breaks the page refresh button. Again, a naive approach of, of this means you've changed the URL up there. So when the user clicks refresh, it's gonna try to load that URL, which doesn't actually exist. Which means that you have to actually make pages that match all of the possible states in order for this to be sensible, or have a server-side language interpret the URL and deal with it the same way, which means you're writing code in two places. So it's not a perfect solution. So one way around some of this is to use fragment identifiers. Um, or hashes, as people often refer to them. The part of the URL that doesn't get sent to the server. So this lets us store state information the same way within the URL, but not actually identify a different page to the server. And this solves some of the refresh problem. So when we load the page or refresh the page, we're just grabbing the part of the URL up to the hash Part of the part after the hash is never sent to the, by specification, it's never sent to the server. The server doesn't even see it. Only our JavaScript does. <coughs> so that helps somewhat. It doesn't, however, solve another problem, which is, so refreshes work in that we are on the same page, but you'll notice that when you refresh the page, <coughs> Sure, you're on the same page, but you've lost all your state because all the JavaScript is rerun. Your pop state handler isn't going to get called because you didn't really pop a state. You're just going to that page with this <coughs> new hash at the end. So to allow bookmarking or sending links to people, we want to be able to restore the state of the application using data just from the URL and nowhere else. We could do this on the server side, as I mentioned, if we actually have different URLs for every state and the server can somehow reconstruct that. Or we can do it on the client side if it's hash-based, because it will only be one page and JavaScript can parse what's in that hash and do something with it. So here's a quick example of what that might look like. So you can, you don't even need to use push state for this. You can just call window.location.hash, set that to something, and then, or you could use window history, but with a hash, and then when the document is ready, the first thing we want to do is parse out what's in that hash and use the contents to put the document in the state it should be in. So that's well and good, but it's still messy to write. So one of the things that we want to do is make our code cleaner by putting action handling, what happens when the user clicks a button, clicks a link, and history handling, and put that together. So we're only doing it once. So the idea is that the actions the user take will change the hash, and then we'll use the hash change event provided by the browser to actually react to the actions. So clicking on a link doesn't do anything, or clicking on the button, or typing in the field, whatever's changing the state, doesn't do anything directly. It just changes the state, and our bookmarking feature that we wrote takes care of unpacking that state and actually making the page look the way it should. So the kind of the skeleton here 
Again, we're going to use something like window location hash or window history to change the hash. Then on hash state, we parse that, use the contents to alter the dark document, and then when the document is ready, we just have to make sure that this fires because it won't because the hash didn't change theoretically when you first load the page. So you've got to fire that off to keep bookmarking working. All right, so. Now let's make the job somewhat easier by introducing some jQuery plugins. There are um, several that do this job. Um, I'm gonna talk about just a couple of them. Uh, there's one that, there's actually several that are called jQuery history plugin. <laughs> um, the, the one that I, uh, I think they're all kind of historically forks of the same project actually. Um, this is a little bit antiquated now but uh, I've used this a few times, so I'll show a couple examples of that. One of the newer ones is by uh, Ben Allman called uh, jQuery BBQ, which is a uh, back button and query library. Um, and uh, so I'll give you a couple examples of what these do. The history plugin uh, uses window location hash and handles the fact that IE is not your friend by, um, doing workarounds for browsers that don't actually send you the hash change event. It does this a couple ways. Um, in, I think, IE, it actually puts a hidden iframe on the page so that the back button is handled correctly because when IE sees that the source of an iframe changes, it updates your browser history. So it uses that to trigger these changes. Um, it also uses set interval to pull the hash state constantly in browsers where it has to. Um, which isn't too bad, it doesn't do it too horribly frequently, but it's fast enough to make it feel right. Um, it's a very simple API. You use a single callback for reading the state and acting on it. And you register that once, it's called init. And then there's one function later, anytime you want to change the state, you just pass it the new state. And that's it. And it handles everything else for you. So the code for that looks like this. We, we write a function that takes the hash as a parameter and does something with it. So in this example, we're gonna have a page where um, some links on the page pull in some Ajax content. So we say if the hash isn't empty, we find the div that's called content and we load um, the document ajax.php with a query string of the hash, and the server's responsible for giving us the right content. Then, when the document's ready, we call history init, that was the function I mentioned, with passing this in. So it, it'll do that once the first time, and it'll do it again every time the hash changes. Then, um, here's an example of calling it. When a link with Ajax link as the class is clicked, then we grab the href attribute from it and call history load, which says the state has changed, we're gonna load this particular state, and it will take care of putting it onto the um, browser history and making the back button work. In the interest of time, oops, I just did there. In the interest of time, I'm gonna jump ahead to the other library. Um, it has a little bit more complicated syntax, not much more, but just a little bit more. Um, but one of the nice niceties is not only that it's more modern, but it also includes a lot of utilities for dealing with data in that hash. So in the case I, I gave, it's very simple, simple, single ID we're sending to the server, no problem. But if you're packing a lot of possible variables into your state, you have to do all that by hand with the other one. With this one, there are library, there's a library for basically taking a query string and putting it into the hash. So that same example from before in this other library, what we do on this one is bind the hash change event. And it takes care of making sure that that actually gets called even if the browser doesn't have hash change. That's what BBQ does. So you act like the browser is HTML5 capable even if it's not, and it takes care of papering over the cracks. Um, so then what you can do is call, this is something that adds $.param.fragment 
which will give you reliably give you the hash. And it's doing the same thing in this case. We're going to trigger the hash change event when the document is initially loaded. There's no init equivalent in this one. So you need to manually say, do this. <laughs> manually say, draw. <drug. laughs> All right, so one last thing I want to uh, talk about while I have a little bit of time is one other drawback here. And that is what happens if you have um, an AJAX driven informational site as opposed to user content driven and you want Google to be able to index all of your content. So one answer here is you don't care because you were really good about making your page not need JavaScript and be able to get all this whole content anyway so Google can. But suppose you're not quite that careful. Um, Google ignores the page fragment at the end because servers do and it tries to mimic that behavior as much as possible. So by default, it'll ignore it entirely. Um, so again, you can solve this problem by placing all the content on your pages, uh, on pages that are accessible without JavaScript at all. Otherwise, you can use the Google Ajax Crawling API, which um, I will just, <coughs> I think that's it for my slides anyway. Um, show you this, uh, this is the Google document, document about this, um, you can find this on Google's <coughs> site, but basically what they do is every time you have this kind of thing on your page where there's a hash there, you put an exclamation point right after the hash mark and that is seen as, taken as a flag for Google that it should actually find the content of that page. So it slows down the crawling of your site because it has to deal with this, so you shouldn't do it unless you're actually using Ajax state. And then there are some more details about that. So there is a way around it, but I would recommend, if at all possible, make your page accessible without JavaScript. Yeah? I have you know, what's the problem with that really on that? I've seen my construct before. On the, oh, on the exclamation point? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a legal character in a hash. So it's only special to Google. It's not special to anyone else. Now, would I have to change, change my hashtag inside, inside, inside the uh, page by something like that? Uh, yes. The, the, basically, you have to make any links that would go to this state have that exclamation point in. So you actually have to have to craft your page around it. In my opinion, more trouble than it's worth. Try to do it without JavaScript if you can. Um, I'm about out of time, so I will just give a couple quick examples of this technique in action, and if you want to uh, follow up with me after, then I can go into the details of how they work. But um, here's here's a um, Ajax app that um, did a while back um, that is a product for allowing people to see what their deck might look like um, after they've uh, bought these various products, so that you can say change to this post cap and it will render the appropriate um, part. And when I say render, this is a complete sheet. This is all transparent PNGs. There's no actual 3D rendering going on at all. So this is just a stack of PNGs we're floating between. Everything's in JavaScript. So um, the, the nice thing about that is that we can track exactly what the user did. They changed to these funky curvy balusters and they uh, wanted, I don't know, this dark wood on the deck. And now we can click the back button and step back, oops, <laughs> step back and forward through our actions. And if you'll see here up on the URL, it's got this somewhat ugly uh, state information here. So the other advantage is you can bookmark this, reload this page, you'll come right back to that exact deck that you were looking at before. Uh, this is using that first one, the first of the two libraries. I would have really liked if, if BBQ had existed at the time because I have to do all this parsing 
splitting and parsing and constructing this hash myself, that would have been done for me with BBQ. So I've got a couple other examples I can show, but I'm out of time. I don't want to run over too much. So feel free to talk to me after if you've got more questions. Any quick questions I can answer to everyone now? Well, um, I, actually, I don't know if they've hatched that one. I kind of doubt it, um, because they tend to hatch more uh, appearance than behavior, right. as a rule. Um, so I kind of, I, they, they generally would leave those kinds of things to these kinds of libraries, but I don't know that for a fact. But uh, I do know that both of these libraries will work back to IE5 or something like that. So. <laughs> So you'll get the compatibility of either one. All right, talk to you later if you've got more questions.